So I want to talk about how we can supercharge our SEO strategies and gain a competitive advantage by building better links than our competitors. But if we want to do that, we need to stop chasing the same links as everybody else. Because if we do that, if we build the same guest posts as everybody else, if we chase the same resource links, how can we expect to win? And if we, if we look at how we should be building links, well, Google's actually been telling us how to build great links for years in their webmaster guidelines. And if we look at just an excerpt from that, we see that we should be creating unique and relevant content, which naturally gains popularity. And really, that publications readers find valuable. They share, they want to consume that content. But actually, when we come to address the topic of link acquisition, then metrics, as far as I'm concerned, don't give us the full picture when we look at domain authority, etc. Because that doesn't necessarily tell us whether these links will be clicked, whether these links will add value, drive conversions, help to build our brands. So one of the things that I do when I'm boarding a client is I ask them, would they still want this link or these links if Google didn't exist? When we start to think about links as more than just impacting our SEO strategies, we start to get a better idea as to where we should be building links from and how we can drive growth in that way. And I run a digital PR agency, and every week we earn links and coverage from sites such as these, some of the world's top tier publications. And we do that with often fairly controversial and fun headlines. So here's just a few examples. Last year, we launched a campaign that revealed that half of the Kim, Car that half of the Kim Kardashian's Instagram followers are fake. We looked at the countries where you can't drink tap water. Some really sort of impactful headlines. But if we then look at why we do this, it's because links still impact organic growth. And here's a search metric screen grab from one of my clients in the finance sector. And this is six campaigns overlaid that we launched. There was very little else done in this period, nothing from a technical perspective, very little in terms of content. And this is the growth we saw on car insurance terms. Now, my opinion is very much that you don't need to write guest posts. You really don't need to be paying bloggers to sponsor content and build links that way. And you sure as hell don't need to be chasing old articles and saying, I've created a new guide. Please will you, please will you link to this instead of that? To me, as a link builder, it's a little bit embarrassing. It's something that most of us were doing probably seven or eight years ago. And in most cases, it just doesn't work. So what do you do? Well. As far as I'm concerned, create and promote contagiously creative content, which gets people talking. And that really comes down to combining data-driven assets with PR tactics. And here's a few examples of campaigns I've launched over the past few years for clients. This was a, a campaign we called You vs. the Kardashians. We, we, look, we created a tool that allowed you to enter your salary, and you would see how quick the Kardashians would earn that. We had a hard-hitting headline that Kim Kardashian earns the average UK salary in six and a half hours, links from over 200 publications. Very recently, we started working with a brand in the beauty sector. They're a comparison platform. So we launched the Cosmetify Index. We did a data-driven analysis into essentially the hottest beauty brands and the most popular brands based on a number of data-driven factors. What this does as well as build links, it positions them as experts in their space. They're a beauty comparison platform, and we're positioning them as experts and building links at the same time. Here, we looked at the world's hardest working musicians for a music college. Now, the link numbers we earned here, we had 29, 30 links, which isn't maybe as high as some, but what we actually got is Lewis Capaldi, who came out top. He shared this on his Twitter. He talked about it on Capital FM. Things that helped to build our clients' brands beyond just links. And the last example I've got here was in the finance space, a study into how long it took the world's billionaires to earn their first million, earning topical coverage from finance and business publications. But to me, the reason I use digital PR as a tactic to build links is because we get so much more value than if we were writing guest posts, just building resource links. You can build brand awareness, drive social engagement, we see real referral traffic, we build our clients' authority, and we build trust. And actually, as an industry over the past few years, we've all been talking about the concept of EAT. And to me, links can impact this, because when you land great coverage with content that aligns with the brand, you position yourself as an expert, you build authority, and you build trust. 
But if we look at why the majority of us really build links as SEOs, it's because we know that great links still increase the site's authority and lead to higher rankings, and that typically means more money. Whether we're agency, whether we're in-house, typically the reason we're launching SEO strategies is because we want to make either ourselves or somebody else more money. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I want to share how I build better links for my clients than their competitors and how you can do the same. And it takes three things to launch a campaign which drives success. And that's a newsworthy hook, it's solid data, and a link-worthy asset. And I'm going to break down these things and start by looking at how you can find a newsworthy hook. And for those of you perhaps not familiar with PR terminology, the hook is really just what catches the attention of journalists, what makes them want to cover your content and link to it, and what makes their readers want to consume that content. But it really all starts with a great idea. I'm a strong believer that you can take a great idea and execute it in any one of a number of different ways. You don't have to be launching interactive assets. You don't have to be going for this format or that format. But what you absolutely can't do is take a poor idea and dress it up in a format, because it just doesn't cut through. So where do you start? Well, find a topic that your audience cares about, that they can connect with. And you can do this by starting to ask questions. So the first thing I do when working on ideation for any client, any brand, is start with a bit of a simple mind mapping exercise. Ask the top, what topics relate to your business. Start with the brand in the middle and start talking, start thinking on a mind map exercise. What are the topics that you, your customers think of? What do you think of when you talk about your business, talk about your brand, and work out from there? It'll give you a very quick indication as to the topics it makes sense for you to be talking about in digital PR campaigns. And once you do that, you're building links which help to position you as experts, help to build authority. And then look at the questions which people are asking. You can head to Google to do this, and you can start to get an idea as what are people actually asking? What do people want answers to? Because if you know that, you can start to work that into your campaigns, and you can launch PR-driven assets. You can launch content that actually answers the questions and helps your audience. Other, other ways you can do this is a tool that was launched last year, alsoask.com, there's answerthepublic.com. There's tools available for us to do this, and there's no reason why we can't have a list of questions related to our topics that we can start talking about. But with every single client I work with, with every brand, the first thing in the onboarding process is I'll say, OK, well, what are the five dream publications you want to be covered in? Why do I ask that? Well, I ask that because a client knows their audience better than I do when I start working with them. And if they know where their audience are hanging out and the publications that their audience are reading, I can then go and take the time to analyze that content, analyze the articles that these journalists or these publications are covering on a regular basis, and get an idea as to what they will and won't cover and what they're talking about. And then go and sit down with your data team. If you have any form of unique data as a brand, that's really valuable from a PR perspective, because it's something that absolutely nobody else has access to. If you can find a way to turn that into a, into a PR campaign and use that, you can gain some real traction by having something unique which nobody else has access to. But then you need to know what the competitive landscape looks like. You need to know what your competitors, as well as similar brands in your sector, are doing to land coverage, to build links, because you can learn from their failures and you can learn from their successes. Ahrefs is a great tool for this, and if you look at the Best Buy links and sort it by unique referring domains, you'll start to get a really quick understanding as to what's worked for those brands, what hasn't. You don't just have to learn from the campaigns that you launch yourself. Learn from others, and you're going to be at an advantage. And then it really comes to building out a list of seed ideas and concepts. For every campaign I launch, I've probably had 30 to 50 seed ideas that are then refined down into a campaign. And it's really just about, it's about having, having an idea. It's not about having a final concept. It's about being able to say, OK, these are things we could do, and then you move to the next stage. And that's where to find data. Now, why do we use data to drive our digital PR campaigns? It's because data gives credibility to stories. As PRs, we're under continued scrutiny from journalists to say, OK, how can we trust this data? Why should we build a story and write an article around this data? Can we trust it? Where does it come from? And data helps to give credibility, but it also allows you to create a talking point. 
Over the past few years, I've launched some pretty controversial campaigns that could have landed me in trouble had we not backed it with solid data. Nobody can argue with data that's trusted. And even when you're pitching that out to the press, yes, people may not like it. It may create controversial opinions. But if you're using data to back it up, it's suddenly no longer somebody's opinion. But you do need to make sure that data is trustworthy. Long gone are the days where we can launch campaigns on data that doesn't have a solid methodology and that perhaps wouldn't stand up under scrutiny from these journalists. So where do we get that? Well, surveys are an option. Now, my personal preference is to try and avoid surveys where I can. They're not as effective as they were maybe two years ago. But if you want to get consumer opinion in B2C sectors, surveys are still a great way to do that, as long as you layer them into something else rather than just pitching them out in a press release. As I mentioned a few moments ago, having your own data is really, really valuable. I will ask everybody I work with, what do you have in terms of data? What can you get internally? Because often in-house marketers and teams, they're not thinking that way. They're not thinking what can they use of their own to launch campaigns. And it's a really great starting point because you can get some really creative ideas and again, pitch out something that nobody else has. Social media data. Some of the best campaigns I've launched in terms of volume of coverage have been built off the back of data from Instagram, from Twitter. Why? Because it's something we can all relate to. The majority of us in this room use social media, and if we look at stats around hashtags, around, you know, we've looked at fake followers on Instagram, it's something we can all relate to, which gives that connection between the story and the audience. But as does Google Trends, if you want to showcase how Consumer interest has changed over time. If you want to compare regions, if you want to compare interest, Google Trends is a great way to do that, and another really great and easily accessible source for your campaigns. And government data. If you're working in an industry where you can launch campaigns which hook regionally, government data is great. Again, nobody will argue with this data. And it gets even more interesting if you can then go and layer your own data with data from government sources and create a real talking point campaign. And then third-party data sets. The example I've got here is TripAdvisor. And the pushback and questions I'm often faced with are, well, these are copyrighted sources. We can't just go and lift these for our campaigns. Well, my top tip here is simply ask permission. I've only ever had one source say, no, you can't use our data, and that was the World Health Organization. Everybody else we've asked, brands, institutions, etc., they always say, yes, of course you can, so long as you credit. Now, another top tip here, and what I often do here, is I will reach out to a brand's SEO team on LinkedIn, rather than going to, say, the PR team, and I'll say, look, we will give you a link for this to credit you as the source. And usually within a couple of days, they're saying, yes, of course you can use the data. So we've got the seed ideas. We have data sources. So how do we refine these ideas into killer concepts? And that's what I want to share now. And it's based around a validation process that we use to turn seed ideas into great campaigns. And it starts with talking about headlines. When you've got an idea of something you could launch, you need to know what are the headlines that a journalist could pull. If you can't summarize your campaign in two or three simple headlines, there's a really good chance you haven't got a story. And if you haven't got a story, why would a journalist care? And then you need to look at whether this concept has been launched before. My personal preference is if something similar has been done in the past 12 months, stay well away. If you're outside of that 12-month period, and you can use Google News to Google keywords and topics around the concept you're going to launch, and you'll quickly see whether it has been, has been done by somebody else. If it's outside of that year, then you, again, you just need to ask, well, how can we add value? You don't want to just be taking a campaign that somebody else launched and relaunching it in a very, very similar angle with similar stories. If you can take something and make it unique and add new data into it, you can create something that is valuable and you've often got that validation that it will work and drive coverage. But then you need to know why, will, why would anybody care about the content you're creating. We know that the best stories are built around evoking some emotional response. So do what I call the pub test. Head down the pub, go and talk to your partner, go and talk to your friends, go to the other side of the office and share the concepts that you're considering launching and see how they react. If they show an interest, then there's the potential to have a strong campaign. If they look like they couldn't care less, then that's probably what journalists and the rest of your audience will think as well. Really start to think about why would somebody care about this content I'm creating. 
But then you need to think, are there enough journalists covering the topic? If you're working in a really, really small niche and launching campaigns in that, ask how accessible this pool of journalists is. If you've only got a pool of 10, 15 journalists, say in the UK, in France, that are covering these topics on a regular basis, you need to ask whether you've really got enough of a pool to pitch into to drive the success you need to. But the big one is asking, could a journalist do this themselves? Now, back in 2013, 2014, I was creating infographics on 10 top tips for this, 10 top tips for that, and we could land 50 pieces of top-tier press coverage. Times have changed. If a journalist can launch something themselves, they will. So ask the question to yourself on how are we adding value to this journalist? What can we give them that they can't do themselves? So then you need to look at launching your linkable assets. We need to remember that journalists cover stories, not formats. Journal journalists don't care if you're launching fancy interactive assets. They don't care what that format is. They want the stories. They want the headlines. So you need to make sure you're choosing the right format to tell the story as opposed to choosing a format because that's what you want to launch. But what I am going to say is that a press release is not a campaign format. Traditional PRs will often try and launch campaigns based simply on a press release. But what's the reason to link? In my opinion, there isn't a reason to link. So what can you do? Well, interactive assets, when the story calls for it. I'm very much on the, on the grounds that you shouldn't launch an interactive asset simply because that's what you feel you should do. If the story needs it, if there is a way to add value with an interactive asset, by all means do it. But you don't need to go to that as default. Static visuals. Now, many say that infographics are dead. And whilst I would never pitch out we have launched an infographic, static visuals are still a great way to display data. Charts are a great way of data visualization. So don't be afraid to go simple and just drop static visuals. But you can also just publish content as a blog post. Now, this was a fun campaign which did really, really well, actually, for a client of ours who works in the in the children's space, and we looked at the world's most popular Disney tattoos, and we simply embedded Instagram photos, and we landed about 40 or 50 pieces of coverage for this. It took two hours to put together, and it did really well. You don't need to go for big, fancy assets unless you need to, but what you must make sure is that your assets add editorial value. But what is that? Well, here's a quote I got from one of the editors at the Daily Mail in the UK last year. And he told me that he's happy to link to a page which contains extra value, but not to a brand's homepage. And why is that? Well, it's because their readers think that they're being duped into reading an advertorial, and links strengthen that suspicion. As marketers, we need to understand the challenges that journalists themselves face. If they are having feedback that they can't link to homepages because they are under scrutiny for linking, that homepage links look like advertorials, we need to work around that. What can we do to help that journalist to allow them to link to our content? But really, editorial value, it's about adding something extra to a user's experience. If a journalist can cover a campaign and everything there is on that article, what's the reason to link? There isn't. So we need to make sure that on our assets, on our campaigns, there's something that adds extra value on the other end of that link. And just to finish off, we know that journalists are receiving hundreds of pitches from PRs every single day. So when it comes to launching a campaign, just ask yourself, how will your campaign stand out? How are you doing something different to your competitors, yet doing something which helps you build better links, position you as experts, and helps to build your brand? Thank you very much.